if I rush a little bit in one or two places, it's because I originally designed this talk to be 30 minutes, um, and uh, actually 25 or 20 is fine as well. So I'm going to be talking about um, uh, a project that I've been working on for a few years now at the Council for Geoscience. Uh, we called it Pygmy um, for two reasons. One, it sounds cool in my opinion, but um, but the other one is that it makes a lot of sense. It's the Python geophysical modeling and interpretation. And um, what I want to talk about is how this sort of came into be. And even if this is not something that you will use directly for yourself, which I'm sure is the case in many, for many people, um, at least you know you can see what we did and, and, and how easy it was to achieve some of these things. Um, so a little bit about myself quickly. Um, I work for an organization called the Council for Geoscience. It's essentially the Geological Survey of South Africa, so it's like the USGS. Um, it's about 100 years old and it deals with all sorts of geological disciplines, um, pre predominantly dealing with um, the mapping of geology in the country, um, although in the recent sort of last decade or so, uh, things like environmental projects as well as geohydrology geological projects have become a lot more important um, to us. I work in the head office, which is in Pretoria. It's, um, it's one of the capitals of the country, um, or it is the capital of the country. Um, but there are regional offices around the country that were mostly started for uh, as mapping basis for the geologists to go out. So um, geophysics at the Council for Geoscience, it um, covers most of the bases that you would expect in any kind of geophysical unit. Um, we do um, pretty much almost every uh, type of geophysics, ironically, except for seismics. Okay, so um, so we we've gotten used to doing everything else. Um, we we tend to concentrate on data sets like magnetic data, gravity data, and radiometric data, which is for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's it's a kind of a natural background radiation. Um, and we're starting to get into hyperspectral data and lidar. Um, so the concept of massive data sets, truly enormous data sets that we're not used to, is, is and how to deal with these things efficiently is is actually kind of very interesting to us. Um, the role of geophysics in an environment such as ours, I guess, is like in everybody else's environment, is to assist with the geological mapping process for the most part. So, so a typical project in Africa, say, sponsored by the World Bank, w which we've done a few, uh, or been involved in a few, would involve, say, the geophysical phase going in first, collecting some sort of a low-cost data set, which is normally something like airborne geophysics, um, because it's fast and quick and cheap to do, um, infinitely faster and cheaper to do than seismics. Um, and that's why it's done, because accountants like that. And then we hopefully shortcut the 100 years of mapping that went on in South Africa and whatever other place by saying, rather focus your geological mapping in this area and that area, and you produce um, sort of initial um, maps and things that the geologists can use. Um, so that's a kind of an idea. Um, this is a typical process that might be followed. Um, it starts off with, say, the, the collection of data. From there, it would be made into maps. Um, in this case, this is a, a magnetic sort of map that you see there. And from there, an interpretation will start to take place. So that can be either an initial examination of the data, and, from, and you can start to do things like drawing in faults and structures and stuff like that immediately. Um, Janine, my wife in the audience, is, this is what she does a lot of. Um, and, then, uh, and then from there, um, you go on to say modeling selected features that you consider are important or valuable. Um, so the data sets that are used a lot in this, at least at the council, are airborne magnetics. And, and the ra main reason airborne magnetics and radiometrics are used a lot is because they're cheap. I mean, it's sort of the noble reason, I suppose. But, but they really are the cheapest data set out there. So ultimately, you know, for exploration, you're probably going to get a lot of that before you start to, at least on the terrestrial side, before you start to, to use other techniques. We do have a lot of gravity as well. Um, gravity, in our case, we use for largely um, engineering studies. So that's things like sinkholes and stuff like that. Um, we, we have some problems with that in some places. Um, okay, so this slide is more or less the, the kind of the the beginning, the inspiration for trying to do a package of our own. Um, we have quite limited budgets, so um, that's a kind of motivation as well. Now, in, in for those of you that are not familiar with this, um, Basically, this is potential field forward modeling. So the idea is that you have data that you've collected in the field, magnetic data, and then you put it into some sort of a package, and you draw the polygon of whatever you think the geological body is under the ground, 
the, the package then calculates what that, the theoretical response for that, and when you sort of fiddle with the body enough, it match, you match it up to the top curve and you say, okay, there's my body, okay? Many of these packages can do things like inversion and stuff like that, um, and inversion is very useful, but um, we focused on forward modeling in this initial stage, stage because whatever you do with potential field data, especially, if you only inverted potential field data, I can, I can bet you it will be wrong up front. It's just too ambiguous. The data set is way too ambiguous. Your inversion is a tool to get you closer to a sol the right solution. It's not the tool to get you all the way there um, flawlessly. That's my opinion anyway. So we focused on forward modeling up front because with forward modeling you have an idea of say the geology going in and you, you, you're using the magnetic data to solve whatever part of the project problem is that you don't know. So we wanted to move from a 2D case to a 3D case because the 2D case has limitations. It doesn't really take into account anything outside of the profile that you're dealing with, okay? And um, nowadays, of course, we tend to look at a 3D Earth more and more in everything that we do. I mean, obviously, the seismics industry is way ahead of, of us in this, at least, potential fields and stuff like that, I think, in this case. So many years ago, we, um, we, we, we made a first attempt at this. Um, so um, some of these problems that you see over there were, were some of our experience that we, find in, we found with this first attempt, as you'll see in a few more slides time. Um, this was our initial take one. It wasn't using Python. We used a package called 3ds Max because we realized as a geological survey we weren't really going to try to reinvent the wheel. I mean, you have packages out there that do sort of um, the construction of meshes and stuff like that much better than what we could ever hope to do. And 3ds Max is something that I think the entertainment industry uses. And it's kind of like a really sophisticated CAD package that you can do 3D models and rendering and beautiful hair for hair adverts and stuff like that. So, um, <laughs> We, uh, we, we, but what you can do with all these packages, you can add modules which are, in, which are written in C++ or something like that, or a scripting language as well. So we did this. The bits that we added were the parts that would actually take the model that we would draw up in the package and calculate it um, and calculate a theoretical field, and then by manually comparing that field with what we had measured, we would construct the model. So. The pro was that you could construct really beautiful models. I mean, as you can imagine, this package is designed to do this. But the con was that it took so long to do anything that something that you were hoping to take maybe days to do would potentially take months. And the main problem occurred because when you constructed this model, at least in 3ds Max, you would have all of these big sort of 3D layers, and as soon as you wanted to change something, you had to remember to make sure that all of the polygons and nodes and everything moved seamlessly up, otherwise you would have double calculations over what was calculating the theoretical field and stuff like that, and it created quite a mess. Um, the other thing is that 3ds Max, like many of these types of packages, has a huge learning curve. And if you want the average person, a geologist or geophysicist, to use it and they're busy on other stuff, they're probably not going to ever get around to it. So the Take Two event happened um, uh, probably about three or four years ago. Um, we were looking once again into this and we wanted to try to see if we could actually do something a bit more efficient. So we were trying to um, do some ideas of our own in, in a kind of a weird perverse way we decided maybe we should try to reinvent the wheel a little bit. And um, I noticed the, the Maya VI or V um, engine and it looked really promising. Um, but um, it didn't really work out because um, at the end of the day, when you construct a, a kind of a 3D uh, object like a, a tetrahedron, and, you, and in, if you have a layered earth or something like that, and you slice it because you want to put a fault through this model, um, the facets on the actual polygon start to multiply quite fast. And we soon realized that for us at any rate, this was going to get out of our scope of trying to control what was hopefully going to be a neat kind of homebrew project. Um, and, and it would start to get complicated very quickly, trying to track all of these polygons and things like that and keep the faces down to a minimum. Um, the faces, by the way, in the, in the particular algorithm that we use are what actually ultimately ends up calculating the field. So. Um, we sat down and we realized, we thought, well, what, would, what do we really want, okay? And um, what, what it came down to is, I'm not really sure, <laughs> I'm sure it's the same in America, but in South Africa, our most experienced people are basically, say, mapping geologists or whatever who have sort of lived in the field forever, and they come back 
and they can sort of almost smell the color of the rock, you know. But it takes a long time to develop that sort of instinct. <laughs> and if you say to them, right, um, we want to, what do you think is happening there? They have this amazing tool, it's called a pencil. And they take a piece of paper and they just quickly draw it. And, and then you go back to your CAD software and you take so much longer to do something that's even similar. So we re I realize that's what I want. I want to have something that even, even somebody like that could take, or myself or whatever, and just quickly draw it. And that really was what, why we, we started in the way we did it. We, made it we, we decided we would make it work a bit like a paint program. So the proposal was that the modeling package would have a voxel-based solution, meaning that we would have kind of 3D pixels going through the earth. Um, this is very neat because if you do want to do inversions and things like that, you're in the right place, really, uh, if you're doing that sort of inversion. We would have a kind of a paint-like interface. Um, instead of different bodies, we would, have, we would call them lithologies. What I mean by that is, say, if you think about the GIS analogy, you have a shape file with, say, polygons, and each polygon has a set of attributes. It's the same for all of the normal 2D modeling uh, programs. Each kind of body would be like a polygon, and that would have all of its geophysical attributes. But if you wanted a body that was identical in terms of its properties next door, you'd have to duplicate all the attributes. It can, kind of gets a bit tedious. So instead of doing that, we would actually have um, one attribute that would be coded, I guess, you could say to the color of the lithology in the paint program. And that's it. You just draw this thing and it links up neatly. Um, so before we actually really got far into this, we came across the biggest challenge for us at any rate, which was the calculation. I'd actually read in somebody's PhD thesis that the calculation of, this sort of calculation of say little boxes is not really that often done because it's such a, a time consuming calculation. So I was stubbornly decided to do it anyway. Um, so here's the problem. If you have 100 by 100 by 100 voxels, which is not very big, okay, it's quite small. Um, that implies that you have in your volume um, a million cubes, okay, and if you had a voxel above each of the surface cubes, that would be 10,000 observations. So that ends up being um, 10, 000, uh, 10 billion calculations, okay. And basically what, what you're trying to do is when you're calculating potential field data, you have a calculation point or an observation point, and you try to calculate the magnetic field at that point, but it must take into account every single cube in your model. I mean, in theory, it takes it over, you know, infinity. Um, but um, so, so you have to take into account everything, okay? And um, in my first version of this, I worked out that if I actually let this, my program run to completion, and I have no doubt, I probably programmed it badly and everything like that, but, but it would be like seven years before my little program completed, which was not really the point of the project. So um, what we did in the end is we realized that, and, uh, is that we could approach the problem from completely the different point of view. Instead of saying we have all, we're calculating for one observation point over the entire Earth, we would rather say um, we take one cube out of that whole voxel thing and we calculate all of the observations for that one cube. Because it turns out that if you have an adjacent cube, its, its observations look exact, exactly the same, except they shift a little bit. And the resultant sort of anomaly is just a sum, okay? And that, that when you can make that assumption, you can save a huge amount on your calculation. And one, and one of the reasons why I'm illustrating this is because I think often, and this is what I've experienced, is when you have a bottleneck, you, sometimes the easiest way to get around it is to try to visualize the problem from a completely different perspective. Um, no matter how much you optimize it, I wasn't really gonna easily get around the seven year thing. Maybe using C++, but I was kind of stubbornly wanting to use Python, so uh, it still would have been inefficient. So here is what it does. This is a kind of a top-down view. Um, you, you basically, on your single cube, you calculate over um, a large amount of observations, at, even including outside of your area. The faded dots represent outside of where my study area is. And then based on that, when I want to know what that is on the cube next door, I just kind of have to sh shift that sort of grid along and add it in. And that's it. So. Um, what that meant was that 100, um, what's that? 100 million calculations, let's say, would reduce down to 40,000 calculations. And that, that changed the whole thing for us. We were able to suddenly take into account a form of calculation where I'd sort of previously read wasn't that, that really feasible because it would be too long. So um, now we're good to go.
so we decided now we were going to use um, Python. Um, the, the selection was kind of an easy one once I looked into it enough. I wanted a, a mathematical type of language. I wanted a free type of language. <laughs> I wanted something that would do um, a front-end interface because most of the people that are going to use this are not going to be Python programmers. That we, you know, This is aimed at people that just want to use a piece of software. So um, the interface we did in, in, well, it was originally PyQt, but I changed it to PySide. Um, and um, importing of data, we used the GDAL libraries, um, reprojection of data as well, GDAL libraries. It's a very convenient way to do that. In the actual forward modeling calculation, I did everything Python where I could, but, but the one step, the one most critical step, I had to do some of it in Python because um, there were just too many nested loops and I couldn't get around it. I sort of spent a long time trying to really stubbornly not do nested loops, but in one or two places I couldn't avoid it. Um, and then um, 2D plotting is done with matplotlib. I have also used... Um, you know, QT's plotting libraries and stuff like that. They are a bit more efficient in, in terms of overheads and um, speed, but they're not as convenient. And from my point of view, a lot of this has to be convenient. I'm not a software developer. I, I'm, I'm a, just a geophysicist. So if it's not convenient, I'm going to start losing interest in a way, you know. That's the point of Python. It must be convenient. So I did use blitting, though. Um, that was kind of nice because it sped up vital parts of what I was trying to do. And then 3D plotting, I used OpenGL in this case. Um, the reason why I went away from Maya VI is because it really wasn't necessary to use it. I'm just displaying a 3D model. Maya VI is fantastic if you want to sort of slice and dice and show what flavor it is at every kind of, but I just want to show the model. And it was, it turned out that the easiest way to do that was just to use OpenGL straight. Um, and then ex export, I could use GL, GDAL. Okay, so this is one of the interfaces. Um, this is in, in the Pygmy software. This is where you can display your data. Um, you'll see that there is a profile um, going across there, and that profile is where we'd be modeling. This particular image is of the Bushveld, um, which is a, sort of a particularly famous piece of geology in South Africa. It's really, really big. Um, it's a couple of hundred kilometers wide. Um, and so the idea is in this screen you can view your data and you can decide at what, what point in the data you're modeling. Although you're modeling along a layer or a profile, you are, all the calculations are done in 3D and it's totally continuous as you'll see just now. The next is something that we don't have, well I haven't seen really in, in, in any um, forward modeling packages, is the, the ability to actually just paint in your model but on a layered view rather than a, on, you know, slicing in vertical slices um, is to be able to sort of paint in what you think are the extents of the model and a layer view so you can go down at each layer which is a depth um, and decide what your geology is going to be. And then at the same time, as if you go across to the next tab immediately, whatever you've done in the layers will be translated across to this, and you can then draw in the geology of, that you've got over there, just like a paint program. If you don't like something on an editing point of view, you just paint over it with the background. It's kind of really easy. Um, so from all of this, um, there are the lithology selectors, what I talked about a bit earlier on. You can see that it's coded to, say, the color, and uh, you select on something, and then you can just draw that in. Um, and then when you're ready, you press the calculate button and it calculates the resultant field from that and that the calculation is pretty quick given what you're trying to do. And then you move on. The, the biggest bottleneck with this is if you, is, is if, it's, if it starts to use so much memory that you have to have more like RAM on your machine. Um, but um, that's a little bit unavoidable if you consider how fast some of these things can, can grow. So the output then is, um, is in, in anything like this, is going to be some sort of a calculated raster image. And there is another tab that we have over here for this. And if at the bottom of that image, you can see that there's a slider. And you slide that across so that you can sort of quickly move between the two images, whether it's the, the original one or the, the new one. And, and this uses, say, blitting, because it's, you don't really want to be redrawing all of the numbers and stuff like that and the color bar every time that you're shifting the slider across. Um, and then once you're happy with your model, you can actually just view it at any point in time. So because the, the model is, is being done as a 3D kind of set of voxels, um, it's pretty easy to actually display something like this using Qt's um, OpenGL or Pi OpenGL or something like that, and, um, and then rotate and do whatever and select on a feature and, and highlight that feature or whatever, um, and save that image if you wanted to into a paper. 
So from there, we thought, well, this is fantastic. We can do so much with this thing. Now we're going to conquer the world. So we decided we wanted to actually do more um, with, um, with pygmy. The idea being that it should grow into something that if, if for whatever reason, you know, we do something else, then we can add it onto that. But just adding something on to just a front end like that makes things very messy. So these are some of the things that we thought of adding onto it. Um, and we came up with this. The, the, the flow thing is actually um, inspired from the, one of the tutorials that you come with, uh, that comes with PyQT. But the idea is that each, say, mini program or whatever that you have can actually be, um, get represented on that flow diagram. And so if you're going to import something, then do smoothing and then do modeling after that, you will see a complete flow diagram. You can interrogate each section of the flow diagram and say, what does this look like or whatever. And um, this is very, very, I like this a lot because you can see exactly what you've done with the data. I, 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 sometimes I sort of despair because especially when I see new scientists in South Africa, um, they don't always understand what they're doing in all these phases. And packages don't always draw this out. So I think even as a learning tool to actually see what's going on at every sta stage, this can be quite nice. Um, yeah, I did a slide so that people could see what we had used um, for the libraries. They're all sort of some of the most prominent ones that get talked about at this conference. And, um, and then some of the modules that we added to the new um, package. This is sun shading. Um, I think it's also called hill shading. Um, this is not Matplotlib's hill shading. Um, this is just me coding up the sort of thing. I do use Matplotlib to display it, though. Okay. And the reason why I brought this up is because this is a good example of, say, you, um, you see a routine in a paper. It does something a bit different than what the standard people are, and you have an ability with Python to code it up. In this particular case, in geophysics, when, when we deal with hill shading or sun shading, it's always you have a, an aspect and an azimuth. You know, the direction that the sun is shining towards the geology creates these shadows. There's no other parameters, at least not on the software that we have. Okay, nothing. Whereas I, find, I just did some reading and found out that actually this originates from, say, geographers who were trying to make really nice mountains in their atlases, and they came up with lots of stuff with this. They have, like, a and glossy and all sorts of nice stuff that happens. So there's a lot more parameters that you can have. The comparison of these two images, they both have exactly the same aspect and they have the same, uh, what's it, um, azimuth. But that has a couple of other parameters tweaked. And there's no clipping or anything that I would have seen in other packages. It's just, it just shows uh, what you can do if you, if you have something like Python. Okay, this is a result from a cluster analysis. I wanted to see the kind of the scattergram and histogram. This is sort of a good example of um, Matplotlib in action. I think I must stop soon. Um, the, we outputted our model to a KML file for Google Earth. Um, I didn't use any libraries for this because the, the script is actually quite trivial to write up, so it's really just a bunch of sort of saving text to a file and then you input, you, you, you're changing the coordinates. But it is really cool that you can do this sort of thing um, so that you could potentially give a model to somebody. And that's, that's it. Um, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Gordon Cooper and Dr. Hendrik Posh for some of the code that they, that they graciously let me use in the software. Um, and, uh, and what we have now is, is basically a nice, easy to use forward modeling package with cluster analysis and raster tools. Um, I, I don't claim to be a software developer or anything like that, so I'm sure I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, but this, this conference has been pretty awesome, so I have a lot of ideas to take back and, and hopefully you know, get some constructive criticism. Thank you.